Hi, everyone. Eric here. Very quickly before we get to our discussion today with China Africa media scholar Danny Madrid Morales, I want to make sure that you are aware about our daily China Africa email newsletter. Every day I spend about seven to eight hours going through all the latest news reports, academic articles, social media posts, and primary source material in English, French, and Chinese, all to build what's effectively an intelligence brief on what's going on. And right now, everything is focused on COVID-19 and how it's transforming Africa and China's engagement on the continent. Access to high-quality information is now more important than ever. And that's why I'd like you to try out the newsletter. It's free for the first two weeks just to see if you like it. You can cancel any time, and you can let me know what you think, and we'll we'll work something out. But I want to make sure that you give it a try, and there's also half off for students and faculty. To find out more, just go to chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. Once again, that's chinaafricaproject.com slash subscribe. The China and Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Witt University in Johannesburg. The ACRP promotes balanced, considered reporting on Africa-China relations through innovative training programs held throughout the year. More information at africachinareporting.co.za. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good afternoon to you, Kobus. Good afternoon. Kobus, we are in the midst of the COVID-19 crisis, which is now keeping, I think, about half the human population at home. And in Africa, it is now starting to ramp up. Now, in Africa, we've been talking about over the past, say, one or two months that this is emerging from being a health crisis to an economic crisis. And now today we're going to be talking about it as an information crisis. One of the things that we're noticing in our daily news coverage of China Africa for our newsletter is the amount of fake, misleading false information, rumors that are now circulating. Uh, One of the ones that uh, the Nigerian government is trying to combat today is the fact that uh, the donation from Jack Ma of his personal protective equipment, the masks and the things like that, is infected with COVID ID. And the Nigerian Center for Disease Control is putting out all of this information is saying, no, that's not true. And COBUS in South Africa, you said it's also a very, very serious problem as well. Yeah, there's been all kinds of rumors circulating on WhatsApp and other social media platforms uh, accusing Bill Gates of of planning to be testing unsafe vaccines in Africa. And to the extent that that there was actually, you know, officials had to come back and try and refute this this rumor. Um, And there's, there's a lot of fake news, like all kinds of weird, unfounded rumors are circulating at the moment. So today we're going to be talking about one information source that is standing out from the crowd, and it's Start Time. Start Times, in many ways, is one of the most interesting media companies. And in a crisis like today, where information is circulating both good and bad, uh, people increasingly are turning to Start Times uh, for for information from trusted sources. So Start Times, for those of you who are not familiar, is the pay TV platform that's owned. Uh, by nominally a Chinese private company. I've been to their headquarters in Beijing. Uh, They are not a state enterprise, although they do have relationships with the state. That is, they get money for their China 10,000 Villages program, for example. So there is a relationship uh, with the state. They're in 33 million uh, African homes or 33 million customers in 37 countries. And so by any definition, Star Times is a very, very big player in the African media space. And during this ramp up to the crisis, it's interesting to watch what Star Times has been doing. They've started now publishing or broadcasting a Star Times daily COVID-19 report that's being distributed out onto across their network. They're also, they've just launched a new Learn at Home program in Uganda and Kenya because so many children there are now unable to go to school. So they're doing distance learning programs on their ST Kids channel, and they're going to be adding further educational programs, and they're partnering with local organizations to do that. Um, The other interesting thing, and this seems, again, far out of their kind of mandate, they've also launched a COVID-19 self-evaluation and reference system. The idea is a symptom checker on their Start Times On app, which is you type in your, your symptoms if you think you might be sick, 
and it will then help you determine if you are in fact infected with COVID-19 and then it will tell you where your nearest health provider is. So Start Times is trying to play a big role. Now, we're, we're not here to kind of sing the praises of Start Times. We're here to kind of look at seeing what is it doing and as an extension of Chinese soft power in Africa. And so we're thrilled to have back on the show, it's been a long time, uh, Danny Madrid Morales, who's an assistant professor of journalism in the Jack J. Valenti School of Communication at the University of Houston. He is one of the leading scholars on Star Times and media in Africa and Chinese media in Africa. A very good morning to you from Houston, Texas. Good morning, Eric. Good morning, Kovos. It's great to have you back, Danny. Um, again, we're setting up our conversation today in the context of COVID-19, the misinformation that exists out there. And then there's this big, giant platform with 33 million customers in the form of Star Times. Talk to us a little bit about what you're looking at in terms of the role of Star Times and, and, and the role that it's trying to play and whether or not it's succeeding in that role. So um, what's been really interesting uh, to watch over the last couple of weeks is um, how uh, Startups has taken a uh, first-line role uh, in the fight that China has been trying to uh, uh, lead against uh, disinformation across the world, not just in the case of Africa, obviously, but across the world. And Startups is the one single player that... Um, um, China, and uh, by extension, right, as you were saying before, we cannot... Um, uh, equate uh, Star Times with a all other um, Chinese media operating in Africa because CGTN, Xinhua, China Daily are state-owned and they're under the full control of either the uh, propaganda department or uh, one of the uh, other agencies within the uh, Chinese state. But Star Times uh, has this uh, extension, which is really close relationships with the state and at the same time has a uh, widespread presence that no other uh, company has. And you mentioned that before in the numbers. And even though we don't exactly know how many homes have access to Star Times, what we know for a fact is that no other uh, Chinese company these days has more access to Africans than uh, startups. And that's a key difference uh, compared to all other actors that are playing a role these days, right? So we see... Is that even more than Transon and their techno phones and Boomplay and some of those others, the tech services and phones that they... That right, right. Um, the, the difference would be here that um, uh, those uh, companies, uh, the uh, mobile phone um, uh, operator, um, so uh, manufacturers, don't have access to providing information, right? Um, well, uh, if, you, if you wanted to, and we haven't seen that happening, right? We could see uh, them... Uh, using SMS to uh, contact their uh, customers. But startups has this big difference, which is that nobody watches CGTN. We know that for a fact. But uh, people do watch uh, startups. And uh, that's the easiest way to access African homes uh, because people are there, people are watching. Uh, and if you provide them content through uh, that platform, they're going to be able to uh, watch it eventually, which is something that you wouldn't be able to say with CGTN. And think about this, that if there's 33 million customers, that's just the person paying for the service. Uh, each home, they usually count having four to five people in the home, at least in many cases. So the number of people watching a Start Times program may be in the, you know, over 100 million people. Uh, so they could be quite, quite large. Go ahead, Kobus. Danny, can you give us a bit of a, a, a kind of a background on what is the relationship between Star Times and the Chinese government? As Eric mentioned, it's a private company, but it still has a very close working relationship with the government. Exactly. And that's something that's really important to keep in mind. Um, not only as uh, uh, Eric was saying that um, Star Times was the company that uh, China, the Chinese government selected to uh, lead the uh, 10,000 villages project. And that's a really important project to keep in mind. That comes from the AFOCAC meeting in Johannesburg, where Xi Jinping promised that they would deliver 10,000 uh, villages. They would provide them uh, TB access through satellite um, services. And Startups was chosen as the company that was going to provide that service. And uh, that spreads over 20 African countries. And what happened there was that Startups provided the equipment, but also the uh, content. So those villages all over the African continent uh, now are having um, a satellite dish installed in their village, uh, monitor, and also um, some solar power. Uh, panels so that they could uh, have access to that content. Um, that's an important project, but what I think is even most important is to um, go back uh, a few years and look at the evolution of the company, right? So uh, Startups is led uh, by this engineer by the name of Pan Xingxing, uh, who uh, was not very successful, particularly in China, but then became all of a sudden really powerful when it uh, started um, when he started uh, finding businesses in in African countries, and the way that he did it uh, was by 
uh, so tagging along, going with uh, Chinese uh, diplomats and Chinese uh, officials on business trips to many, many African countries. And that's what gained this uh, first-hand uh, access that very few other companies have. And uh, what I like to say all the time is that um, Peng Xingxing, and you can see that on, on the website of Start Times, has met with over 15 African heads of state of government. And that's something that very few other companies have been able to do. So one-on-one time, with the leader of an African country, gives them access, direct access to um, um, contracts to uh, and, and other benefits that no other company has. If you look at Canal Plus or uh, DSTV, which are the uh, main competitors of Start Times, none of them has been able to have this first-hand access to uh, African leaders. And that's probably the biggest difference, that um, they have access to those in power, and that's what's gaining them access to contracts and other um, important um, uh, options. It's that adjacency to the Chinese state. So again, they're not a state-owned enterprise, but they have a very close relationship with the Chinese government that then opens the door for these political relationships in Africa. One of the things when you go to that you see when you go to the Star Times headquarters in Beijing and you look at the lobby, they have one of these walls of photos. And all the African leaders that come to Beijing, how many go out to see Star Times? And Star Times is not located in downtown Beijing. It's out in the suburbs. So you actually, if you're an African leader, you have to commit a good two to three hours of your day, a very precious schedule to go out and see start times. And this wall of leaders that have come out to the headquarters is very impressive. And it does show, I think, the power of it. One of the things that's most compelling about start times is the fact that they dub so much of the programming into local languages, in Swahili, in Hausa, in Igbo, in French, uh, so many different languages. And they bring you know hundreds of young people over to Beijing. They do the dubbing. They do also live Bundesliga sports in local language. So people are coming for the sports and the family programming and then staying for some of the other things. One of the other things are Chinese dramas. And it's very interesting, Danny, because 10 years ago, when we would talk about Chinese soft power, people would say nobody would watch a Chinese movie except for maybe a Bruce Lee or a Jackie Chan Kung Fu movie, right? Now what we're actually finding is that Chinese dramas dubbed into Swahili, for example, or Igbo, uh, are actually gaining an audience. People seem to like the dramas because they're localized in those languages. Talk to us very quickly about the draw of Chinese content on the Star Times platform. And then we're going to get into a discussion about COVID-19 and some of the messaging coming from Beijing. But talk to us a little bit about that. We have to uh, keep in mind that uh, for quite a while, African audiences were uh, quite accustomed to watching uh so-called Asian and quote-unquote uh, drama. So, for example, Filipino soap operas were circulating in, in, in many African uh, uh, channels for quite a while because they were very cheap to buy, right? So uh, there's not so much... N- a difference between uh, watching a Filipino or a Turkish soap opera and watching a Chinese one. What's key here is that, as you said, they were provided in a local content, uh, in local languages. Uh, not only are they dubbing in, uh, in the languages that you mentioned, but also if you watch, for example, the French dubbing, uh, it's done with um, Cameroonian or Senegalese um, uh, uh, actors. That, therefore, we don't have this uh, sort of imperial French uh, dubbing that would uh, be used in uh, older movies, but it's actually something that feels much more closer to uh, the audience. And then obviously there's the, uh, there's the actual content, right? So many of these dramas go on uh, these uh, stories about uh, family tensions and like uh, grandmothers and like uh, mothers-in-law, which are some things that uh, actually relate quite a lot to uh, uh, audiences in, in both East and West Africa. And those are the places where startups is most, uh, most present these days. And that's the content that they're providing. Uh, it's content that it's interesting and uh, it's not politicized at all, uh, but it's uh, provided in a language that is familiar to uh, the audiences. And that's, that creates this appeal um, that uh, other uh, platforms might not have by providing content that comes from uh, other countries and doesn't feel as proximate, as close as, as, as this would, um, would do. Danny, uh, what, what did you make of the of the initiative announced by Star Times very recently that they're gonna they're gonna put a lot of um, of educational content uh, they're making available to to um, primary and high school students in in East Africa and then also just generally making a lot of their their um, channels available for free. Um, to, to which extent did you see that as as a kind of a Chinese? government public diplomacy initiative and to which extent did you see it as kind of canny kind of commercial competition with competitors like South Africa's DSTV? I think that's a very interesting question, Kobos, because um, 
when I first heard, for example, about the uh, decision to open up 100 channels for free uh, to uh, even non-customers, um, I never saw it as a, a sort of an extension of Chinese public diplomacy, more like um, startups using its uh, own uh, marketing campaigns. And we have to say that uh, one of the reasons why startups is so popular these days is that it's using really like the traditional strategies of uh, uh, marketing and uh, PR in a very effective way, right? Uh, it's sponsoring events, it's creating competitions, it's providing free um, gifts and so on. In, and I, and I, at the first time I thought about it, uh, that's what, I, what came to mind, right? So Startups is being uh, very smart here. It's seeing an opportunity to expand its business. To, uh, we've also seen decrease of prices. In some countries, they've uh, halved the price um, of, uh, of subscriptions during this COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, but then uh, the second story came out, right? Because that's uh, first, like two weeks ago, we heard that t- uh, Startups was giving free content uh, to um, African audiences. And then just recently this week, we read about um, uh, the uh, educational content. And that's something that has left me a bit puzzled, right? Uh, because we've seen some partnership uh, before, uh, both uh, from uh, startups and from other um, Chinese companies in helping uh, the educational sector. But I am not sure whether uh, there has been, uh, uh, and, and that maybe you have more ideas uh, on this topic, but um, I don't know if it's been start them directly, whether African governments have approached um, Chinese um, authorities, because that's a very sensitive area, right? You, you don't want to leave the education of your children to a uh, foreign enterprise, which in the end, that's where it is. And it's not a common foreign enterprise uh, because it's one that's really close to the Chinese uh, state. So even though it's not a state actor, it is very close to the state. So the kind of content that they're going to end up offering um, wouldn't be the one that you would want to leave to a foreign state. That, that has left me very puzzled. Why would uh, a government, uh, obviously nobody has the uh, choice to uh, say we are not going to allow startups to provide this kind of content, but uh, maybe um, governments would want to have more oversight over what kind of uh, content is being shown to their, ki- to their children. Maybe, but at the same time, online, there's things like Khan Academy, and there's countless numbers of educational services online, particularly on YouTube and things like that, that are unregulated by the government. TV, of course, has a different relationship. My suspicion is that the governments, particularly in places like Kenya and Uganda, are way too preoccupied right now with the crisis to be worrying about these things. That would be my suspicion. And my guess is this is a proactive venture from from start times, thinking about it in a very commercial way that... People are at home now all the time. They have to justify the expense of it in many respects because satellite TV, particularly in developing countries where incomes and disposable income is quite limited, is considered to be a luxury. People will go back to free-to-air programming if they if they can't afford it anymore. So they have to add value to the package in order to justify the expense for a lot of people, particularly now as we're going to recession. But let's not forget one thing, Eric, that um, Start Times, and we, uh, we keep on mentioning because that's their main area, it's a pay TV, but they also uh, have a monopoly in certain African countries over the free-to-air signal. And that's something that we tend to forget, right? In some countries like uh, Kenya, um, Start Times was, uh, was partnering with the, with the Kenyan government to provide free-to-air um, content. So for many um, households, Start Times comes into the household not only through uh, pay TV, but also through free-to-air uh, signal and that's a, a presence that it's not even counted when we see these numbers of 33 million uh, customers, right? Uh, and that's not only uh, in in Kenya. We see it in like uh, in some parts in West Africa. They also had an agreement in, in Seychelles and some other smaller countries. But their presence goes beyond um, the pay TV sector. But I agree with what you say that probably just a marketing um, strategy. Yeah, I mean, I, I suspect this. So let me ask you a little bit about the the soft power side of it. Let's go to the politics of it of the moment right now. There seems to be a very schizophrenic view of China in Africa today. That is, on the elite governing level, among, say, politicians uh, you know, at the ministerial level and above, people love China. You'll see Paul Kagame in Rwanda. He'll be tweeting about Jack Ma giving a shot in the arm. Uh, Prime Minister Abayi Ahmed in Ethiopia you know, saying you know, all these wonderful things about China's contributions during the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, so all of those governing elites seem to say wonderful things. Now, down at the civil society level and at the kind of at the, in, the, in the mud of social media, uh, there's a lot of distrust of China. There's a lot of suspicion. This seems to be amplified in the current crisis now, given the connection between COVID-19 and China and the fact that the Chinese now are coming into, the, into Africa in a very big way to you know, provide aid and assistance. Um, so China faces a, a, a problem right now. On the one hand, it is 
really running a masterclass in propaganda in Africa today. It has left the Europeans and the U.S. behind on a way that is just, there's no, com- there's no competition between what the Chinese are doing and what the U.S. can do. The U.S. really doesn't have a state media apparatus in, uh, that's, uh, that comes anything close to what the Chinese are doing. Let's take, for example, uh, obviously there's CGTN, Xinhua. Those are the traditional outlets of state media and propaganda. But what the Chinese are doing in Africa is far more than that. Look at their Twitter feeds of the embassies and diplomats and the message discipline that they have. Look at the paid media strategies. Kobus, you and I were talking about this earlier in places like South Africa, where they're inserting content into newspapers. They also have these content distribution networks uh, into websites across the content from, continent, from the Nation Media Group to Ghana News, where Xinhua content just comes all the time through those uh, on those sites. And they're populating Google with just an enormous amount of content that people are sharing, really unknowing that it's coming from Chinese state media. Layer on top of that, Star Times. Now, Star Times is not, as we pointed out earlier, an extension of the state apparatus. It's a non-state actor. How do you see it playing a role in this soft power dynamic where there are so many moving parts of the Chinese media operation in Africa? What role does Star Times play? Well, uh, what we've seen and what I think is most interesting uh, these days is this new uh, COVID-19 daily report that Star Times is uh, putting out uh, and in multiple language. And that's, uh, there's multiple things that are interesting here, right? One is the fact that it's multiple language, including Portuguese and Swahili uh, and Hausa, uh, which uh, are not uh, supported or like as much uh, 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 the output that CGTN or Xinhua has. But also um, what's interesting here is that uh, Star Times doesn't have the uh, uh, capacity to create this content, right? So in the end, they're going to uh, have to depend on content from CGTN and from Xinhua, which they can repackage, that they can translate. But in the end, it's going to be the same narrative that comes from the same uh, state-owned media. And that's the key difference um, with any other um, country that you want to look. And you said the U.S., for example. The U.S. has no ability whatsoever to go uh, into a every single African household or many of them with a single unified voice. Uh, And China is doing that. And it's doing that uh, by creating content that is not too controversial. And we can talk about the um, ambassador's Twitter feeds in a minute, which is a slightly different approach. But if you look at the overall picture of Xinhua and China Daily, and with all these agreements and uh, 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 content sharing uh, packs that you've mentioned already, Eric, um, and you add to all of that uh, Star Times, which has this advantage of going into households at key points. And uh, if you look at the uh, this daily COVID-19 report that uh, we're talking about, uh, Star Times is showing that across its network of channels. And it's having this... Um, 10, 15 minute report uh, rebroadcast several times a day. And it's going to show that content in some of the key channels. So you have ST Kung Fu, you have ST um, uh, Sino, Sino Drama, ST uh, Sports. So those are Start Times channels that Start Times controls the content 100%. And then at key times, so 7 p.m., 9 p.m., uh, 11 a.m., uh, 1 p.m., you have these. Uh, broadcast of um, news, short, presented or introduced by uh, most of the time an African anchor and uh, nobody who doesn't have a, a, a sort of a high degree of media literacy would suspect that that's content that comes directly from Chinese authorities. And that's the key difference where you are using a tool that hasn't been used before, uh, which is Star Times, that gets to many more African people than any other uh, source. Because yes, we see a lot of content on social media, but many Africans do not uh, read social media on a regular basis, but they do watch TV. And the unsuspected audience that's watching their drama as they would usually do at 7 p.m., um, they would see a 10-minute um, report and they are likely to watch it. And that report is not going to be critical of the Chinese state. It's going to present a specific view of how the situation is going globally. And that's going to uh, gain some uh, extra brownie points for start times uh, with Chinese authorities, because that's going to be a message that uh, the authorities are going to be very happy to hear. You mentioned that some of some of the viewers might not realize that this is a Chinese company. Um, could you unpack that a little bit? Like how how widely known is Star Times Chinese origin, and and what is what are some of its localization strategies in Africa? We we ask uh, we run a survey and we're running a new uh, wave of that survey um, uh, now, uh, and we ask people how do they associate or what do they associate Star Times with, and uh, in in most most cases, people do not relate 
um, startups to a, a, a foreign company. And the reason is that because most of its marketing strategy is very, very localized. Uh, you see startups, for example, producing these reality uh, TV shows in Nigeria, which are introduced by Nigerian um, uh, sort of celebrities that have uh, Nigerian actors, that have Nigerian participants, and there's no connection whatsoever with uh, Chinese content. Uh, obviously, it really depends, and that's what I mentioned before, this idea of media literacy, right? So it depends on how uh, knowledgeable you are about um, uh, ownership. And the same thing happened. We asked people about DSTV. Is DSTV a South African company? Uh, and many people wouldn't even relate DSTV to South Africa. For them, it's just content that comes to them and um, because there's so many channels that are local, and that's a key uh, uh, dimension of Star Times, that they're not only producing content and dubbing it, but they're giving a platform to local channels, to very small startups and very small channels that uh, are providing content that, it's, uh, that feels much closer than, 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 than any uh, other uh, platform. Um, so I, I would say to the question, and I don't have numbers to, uh, to uh, back it up, but uh, our evidence shows that very few people associate Star Times directly to the Chinese government. And um, that's an advantage that um, they have over other channels, which are clearly marked as Chinese. Support for this podcast comes from the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University School of Journalism in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for both African and Chinese journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at Wits China Africa or visit africachinareporting.co.za for information about grants and upcoming seminars. Although the content on Star Times is not censored by the Chinese government the way, say, a CGTN would, because it's all outbound, it's not being broadcast domestically inside China, and that's how they're able to broadcast BBC, France 24, and some of these other these other channels and things like that. But it's surprising for me to hear that people don't know that there's a Chinese connection only because you go to their home pages and you see their programming grids and there's a lot of Chinese dramas and Chinese movies and there's a Chinese Kung Fu channel and there's all of these things. And so that's the only, I mean, DSTV and Canal Plus don't, don't have Chinese content. There's virtually no other Chinese content anywhere that's available. So it's just surprising to me that people haven't made that connection just based on the fact that there's just Chinese content there. But, but but if you come to think for a minute, uh, the same thing happens. I mean, Canal Plus probably because it's a, there's a more, much more closer legacy with with uh, France. But uh, DSTV is not widely known to be South African for many um, people uh, across the continent, um, and and they do have content that's very specifically South African, right? Um, and you, you would you would see the same thing in some European countries where you, you have some providers that um, uh, might have a connection with Germany, you might have a connection with France, and you wouldn't even know if, if you don't really go into the detail of, of, of trying to figure out where that company comes from. And Eric, just to, just to add to that, um, DSTV does actually carry some Chinese content. Like I, I remember interviewing a DSTV executive a few years ago, and they were saying that you, you always, if you're expanding into new African markets, you always need a Kung Fu channel. This is very interesting, and that they they bought Chinese content in order to run their own kung fu channel at some stage. Um, Danny, um, you know, I was wondering, kind of, um, you know, how you how you kind of square the circle between between in, in this in this uh, discussion of localization. To which extent should do you think it would it's useful to look at this as some form of of uh, Star Times trying to act as a as a kind of local African actor, you know, like uh, the, to which extent are they are they kind of concerned about the audiences and trying to put kind of correct information out there as a, as a form of localization strategy, and to which extent are they doing that as a form of of foreign China, um, public diplomacy, and whether that line is really how clear that line actually is. My reading for that is that so this is the first time that we see Star Times putting uh, news content out, right? So. Up to today, up to last week, Statums has never produced any news show. So this is a very new thing. And um, if you ask me one week ago or two weeks ago, I would tell you that uh, Statums has a very localized strategy. Uh, they hire very locally. Uh, all the uh, marketing strategies, all the uh, people who are uh, leading uh, strategies on the ground are local, and they tend to hire uh, in the same country where they are producing, right? So they have Guinean uh, or like Angolan or uh, Nigerian uh, marketing strategies that are putting campaigns that are very specifically local. And that's why they uh, target all this content that um, such as specific football events, uh, they sponsor local leagues, uh, and uh, that uh, makes them a very strong local actor. And I would uh, say that even though 
It has a Chinese um, capital. It is a very African and very localized company. But now when it comes to news content, that's what puzzled me, right? So when you see startups deciding to venture into the news business, um, that's something that you cannot do, even if it's an outward looking uh, um, company, you cannot do that without the uh, authorities uh, in Beijing saying, okay, you can go ahead and do that. Because uh, Historically, no company except for state-owned media were allowed to create content, even if it was meant to be exported. That has never happened before. Um, so when Startups has this ability to do that, it is doing so because it is an extension of the Chinese state. And that's the key idea here, that they do that because they have um, the uh, guarantee, so, so to speak, that the content that they will put out will not be to inform African audiences. It will be to benefit the Chinese state. And I think that's a key difference um, compared to other areas in which Start Times operates. So what kind of risk does that present to Start Times? For example, you mentioned that uh, a lot of consumers don't necessarily make the connection to the Chinese government or the, or China in general with Start Times. Now, all of a sudden, if it's news, is starting to align more with what the Chinese are saying. And there is, to be sure, a battle of narratives around COVID-19 that's going on right now. Uh, certainly about the origin of COVID-19, where the Chinese are trying to sow doubt in the world to say that it didn't necessarily start in Wuhan. And the Americans and pretty much everybody else says, uh, unless there's any other evidence to show us, it started in Wuhan. Uh, that is a very powerful, sensitive narrative that is being contested right now in the, the international you know, discussion. And so Start Times is going to take a side on that, no doubt. They're going to take the Chinese side on that. So if people start to discover more and more that this is actually a Chinese company that has a Chinese agenda, will that hurt its brand and that could it jeopardize its business in, in a very politicized, polarized times that we live in today? Well, I thought that that's what would happen when uh, they announced that they would be doing this uh, daily show, but I haven't seen any pushback whatsoever. And I've been monitoring this for over a week. I haven't seen anybody push back against uh, Start Times doing this. And that reminds me of what uh, we heard over and over when we were, I mean, I've, I've done quite a bit of field work and I've interviewed lots of people in many different African countries. And uh, when you ask them uh, about this idea that, uh, well, what's your reaction to uh, this content that comes from China? S most people say, well, all news organizations have their own agenda. Um, we we were uh, sort of forced to watch BBC or RFE or uh, any other foreign country uh, content for many years. And we put up with it and we still think that BBC has its value. Well, the same thing that we watch BBC and uh, we know that they have their own agenda. Well, now Start Times or whoever it is, they have their own agenda and we're going to watch it and we're going to be doing this critical reading. And um, I think that that was one of the uh, most eye-opening things that I, I found when I when I ex asked over and over the same question to even journalists, right? So they they accept the fact that any of this content comes from abroad, and to many of them, it doesn't make that much of a difference whether it's the Chinese state or any other uh, foreign actor that's uh, putting out this content. Um, and I think that maybe that's the reading that's happening right now. So people, I, I think, if we rewind for a second, right, one thing is I'm not sure that too many people make the connection with uh, the Chinese state when they uh, think of start times. And those that do might be saying, well, that might be giving me a different perspective that I wouldn't get if I watch uh, CNN and uh, and Fox News all the time. Well, so in South Africa, the government has been very, very kind of uh, proactive in order to put um, to put better information out there. So I think there in South, in South Africa, it's a slightly different situation from the rest of Africa in the sense that the government is, is playing a, a very strong kind of interventionist role. Um, and it's it's becoming a, a very much a story of South African, the South African government and its, its decisions about it. China China is definitely, you know, it's definitely in the conversation, um, especially around the delivery of, of aid. Um, but in South Africa specifically, I think China is playing, is, is, is playing a slightly smaller role, I think, in the discussion than it is in the rest of the continent. So if people make the link between Star Times and China, that won't hurt the brand, you know, in your perception for Southern Africa? Not so much, but keep in mind that that South Africa is DSTV country. So Star Times has, has right. tried to kind of make to edge into the South African market, but has so far not been very successful uh, because because it's, it's really centrally got, like DSTV is essentially a TV monopoly in South Africa at the moment um, because because the state-owned channels are so weak. Um, so you know, so so you you know when you're in um, in informal settlements in um, uh, you know kind of in in South African cities, even there like. You see satellite DSTV satellite dishes everywhere, so um, you know it's 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 it really is a, a kind of a centralized voice, and it's not. Sometimes it's not nearly as strong as in, in um, East Africa. 
Um, Danny, just a, a slightly wider question. Um, this issue of the of this uh, kind of public diplomacy war between the U.S. and 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 China, um, and the, you know, attempts to 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 drive the narrative around COVID nineteen in different kind of geopolitical directions. How is it looking from within the U.S.? Do you, do you see a kind of a, you know, a, we, we're seeing over the last few days, I've seen all of these calls, for example, for, um, you know, politicians calling for for China to reimburse the world, for example, for, you know, uh, and all, all of these kind of like rang, like dip, diplomatic wrangles. To which extent is that starting to, to appear in general news discourse in the U.S.? We saw a, a surge of that kind of narrative. Um, so, uh, Probably uh, 10 days ago, something like that, um, uh, Secretary Pompeo, Secretary of State, um, appeared uh, in front of the media and sort of uh, reused that sentence that Trump uh, has stopped using with the Chinese virus, right? And then when Pompeo came on, on, on screen and he was uh, sort of repeatedly using that language, uh, and, um, and at that point, there was quite a bit of discussion, particularly on um, uh, uh, conservative media from Fox News, which uh, has like uh, switches from one end to other of the uh, of, of the spectrum, uh, but that has died down. I, I was surprised to see uh, over the weekend where the UK was picking up this idea that um, China has to pay back and so on. That narrative has died down in the US, and I think that one of the reasons why it has died down is because uh, the number of cases has surged so much in the US, and so many people, even conservative media, are starting to see the actual uh, damage that this virus is having. Um, but I do not rule out that over the next um, few uh, months, we see this narrative coming up again, particularly when, uh, when uh, conservative pundits uh, start saying that uh, it is because China was not uh, containing the, the, uh, the outbreak at the very beginning that the U.S. Uh, is suffering all these uh, consequences, right? And, and I think that, and I wanted to ask you, uh, Cobos, what's your take on this? Um, you mentioned that, uh, and obviously that South Africa hasn't been uh, exposed by startups as much, but um, South Africa has been one of the main uh, receivers of um, Twitter diplomacy, to, so to speak, right? Uh, and after the ambassador Lee Sung Tin uh, left, has, have you seen any uh, continuation of the same narrative uh, being played out uh, on South African social media? Um, not nearly as much as as it used to be. I think because because um, Ambassador Lin um, was was such a such a kind of a strong pusher of that narrative. Um, so you know, so after his departure, he hasn't been replaced yet, and and, and we haven't. So so I, my feeling is that there hasn't been such a strong directing of of this narrative. And in you know, but but you know, in in it's also the country is now in full lockdown mode. You know, um, so the media landscape itself has shifted to, to to a preoccupation with South Africa's response to it. So it's increasingly the discussion around it is increasingly around the South African government and the South African people. Um, you know, with with not a lot of bandwidth um, in in relation to, to to kind of external actors. Eric, how is it looking in Vietnam in relation to the same issue? Well, in Vietnam here, people are, you know, we're on the edge. We have, oh, what, 100 million people and 200 known cases, and things are very, very calm for the moment. The government has been very proactive at testing and tracing and isolating people who are infected. So things are, are quite calm, but it, there is this fear that around the corner is a, a big explosion of COVID-19. There, and, and there's that concern, like in a lot of African countries, that if it gets a hold here, there's really nothing to stop it. The healthcare system simply isn't capable of containing it. And that is, that's the fear that I think a lot of, of people have. Um, very quickly, um, I, I want to get your take on something. I just got a, a post on my LinkedIn page by a young man from Cape Town named Eddie Sungu. And, and I want to read what he said, and it, and it relates to our start time, but it also speaks to the moment of the time. He said, quote, for me, I just feel like my future is ruined by this virus. I don't know if life will go back to normal. It's painful when thinking about all the things, how it turned upside down. I work in the movie industry right now, and everything is closed down. And the thought that this virus, just like in Hollywood, has shut down the content production system in Africa, and it's also going to shut down a lot of the financing, and it's going to take time for Nollywood and some of the South African production groups to get back on their feet. A lot of businesses are going to close. And so in some ways, it seems like satellite TV may actually grow in power, in part because domestic content uh, will struggle to be produced. Two things could possibly happen, Dandy, that I want to get your take on. Either people are going to turn more into star times because that's where content is and they're not getting it from other places, 
or it's going people are going to turn more towards TikTok, uh, Viscuit, the web, YouTube, Facebook, and all of that, where there's obviously user generated content. Uh, but the impact on African content is going to be severe, and it may take months, if not years, before that recovers. Talk to us a little bit about how you see the content landscape being transformed by COVID-19 as it relates to how people get their entertainment and their news and their other kinds of video programming. I think that it really depends on how long this is going to last, right? Uh, if if, if the uh, sort of the uh, impact of the virus is very long term, like and we're talking about two, three, four months, definitely uh, that's going to be a struggle for uh, Nollywood and other uh, and other industries. But at the same time, if you bring the um, the dimension of startups and foreign investors, we've seen startups investing and in, uh, on Nollywood and 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 signing agreements with uh, Nollywood so that they would try to export some of this content outside of Nigeria. So what we might actually see is that uh, startups sees that as an opportunity uh, to uh, reinvest in an area um, that uh, might be uh, struggling for a while, and then um, that might even uh, empower uh, some of the uh, um, strategies that startups is taking. I see that uh, online content, and I'm very always very critical or. or um, uh, skeptical about um, online content. And, and that is because we need to remember that for many, many uh, Africans, uh, still online content is a very difficult content to access, right? Because of the uh, high costs of, uh, of uh, bandwidth, uh, even with bundles and so on. It's really expensive for most people to watch on- online content on a regular basis. So I still see, uh, and we've seen with COVID-19, how strong TV uh, is as a medium. And all over the world, uh, we've seen a peak, a huge increase in the consumption of TV content. And I am pretty uh, positive uh, to say that uh, in the next few months, we're going to see TV being as the main source of uh, not only news content, but entertainment for many, many people. And that might also um, play in the, into the benefit of uh, pay TV providers uh, or, or just regular TV providers that are going to reuse content that they already have or they're going to invest in cheaper content. Uh, but uh, that's going to be, I think, the key marker of the next uh, 6, uh, 12 months uh, of, of content. What a fascinating part of the COVID-19 story that's unfolding in Africa because it touches on information, on entertainment, on the, on, uh, you know, on the quality of information, also the business side of what Star Times is doing. Uh, it's a fascinating company that is doing, that has, again, just an enormous amount of influence and power. Danny Madrid Morales is an assistant professor of journalism at the Jack Valenti School of Communications at the University of Houston. He follows this. He's one of a handful of scholars who keeps a very close watch on uh, on Star Times and really a great person to follow on Twitter. Tell everybody your Twitter name so that they can kind of stay on top of what you're reading and writing these days. So it's at D Madrid underscore M. D Madrid underscore M. That's my Twitter handle. We will put a link to Danny's Twitter handle uh, in the show notes for you to follow him, and I highly recommend it. Danny, thank you so much for taking the time. We really appreciate it and uh, really enjoyed our discussion today. My pleasure to be on the show again. Cobus, one of the key themes of the coverage that we've been doing every day in our newsletter is about this battle of the narratives between China and the rest of the world in many ways. China has a very, very defined narrative about COVID-19. Uh, it is starkly different than what you hear from pretty much everywhere else. It's an incredibly sensitive issue. I just, over the weekend, uh, got ripped apart <laughs> on LinkedIn Uh, because I touched on these nerves uh, related to the origin of COVID-19. And and again, people have such different outlooks in China than they do in other countries related to uh, this, this, this terrible virus that's causing so much damage. Star Times is, in fact, playing a role in driving that narrative. First, it will never go against that narrative. That is the content that Star Times is producing in their Star Times Daily, as Danny said. I think that's a really important point. They may not necessarily overtly endorse the Chinese narrative, but they certainly won't challenge it. Uh, That said, they do carry France 24, they carry BBC, other Western news channels that will have information uh, that does challenge the narrative. But in terms of having a point of contact inside 33 million homes in 37 countries gives it an enormous, enormous influence in driving a very subtle part of that narrative in the kind of struggle to define COVID-19. Yeah, definitely. Um, and we have to point out that I think it's, you, you know, obviously a, a lot of the uh, 
the, as you said, it, they probably won't go um, against this kind of official Chinese narrative about the virus. However, I think the bulk of, of the information they're putting out on COVID-19 is very actionable, very practical information. You know, um, you know, do this if you have these symptoms and, and so on. You know, so in that sense, I think the, the just the, the, the information dissemination service and the public education service that they're doing in Africa is really valuable. Um, because, you know, in Africa, frequently, you know, people frequently don't have access to a lot of information. It's not like in a place like the US, where, where you know, if you want the information, it's there for you in your language. In a lot of African cases, it's not actually available in your language. Um, so the fact that, they, that they're putting out this, this very basic kind of helpful information, I think, is very helpful. It's interesting because the United States struggles to compete against the Chinese in Africa in the soft Sahara space. They don't have an equivalent of CGTN in Nairobi. They don't have Xinhua. They don't have the distribution networks for content like, like Xinhua is being distributed on all these websites. So they're, they don't have a lot of things. But creating content like what Star Times is doing, educational programming for children, uh, doing, as you said, how to do hygiene programming and and how to stay safe during the COVID-19. Those are things that the Americans could be doing to buttress their own soft power play in Africa and in other parts of the world, but they're not. And their head just isn't in that game. And I think the Chinese, this is again why I say the Chinese are so far ahead of not just the Americans, but the, I don't think the French are doing it, the British are not doing it, nobody's doing it. This is a space that the Chinese have to themselves and then we haven't really even gotten into the whole transcend techno in Phoenix, that tech space that's going on, which is also a very influential uh, piece of the pie here because transcend, like Star Times, plays the role of gatekeeper. What gets onto their platform, what doesn't. And so these are very, very powerful roles that these companies have. But it is interesting how there are opportunities for other countries. Uh, and other players in Africa to take this role. You can create content and buy time on any number of different networks the same way that advertisers do. The cost of entry is actually not that expensive by international media standards. So it certainly is an achievable goal that the United States, who is struggling to compete against the Chinese for this battle of the narrative, uh, is missing. And I'm just surprised that they don't do it. But again, I mean, the, the Americans are proving to be rather incompetent when it comes to soft power diplomacy, uh, particularly in Africa. Well, I think one one reason is that that budgets to those agencies have been have been whittled away over you know over several decades. Um, it was always, I think, especially after the Cold War, it was difficult to 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 get uh, the U.S. government to keep funding these public diplomacy efforts because there was the perception that they're not as needed anymore. Um, you know, in, in the era after the the Soviet Union, um, and so so a, a lot of you know the um, those services in the U.S. Um, have were very strongly staffed in the past. Um, it, they were very robust, and you know, slowly those people eroded away. Um, and so, so I think in a lot of cases, they actually don't have the kind of personnel to be able to launch this kind of massive information rollout at, at the moment. But of course, the U.S.'s public diplomacy is always a different game than everyone else because they have Hollywood. Um, you know, so it's it's a different it's a different situation than just these these official uh, you know communication channels because the U.S. have non-official communication channels that that push out a kind of a, a U.S. centric message, but in a way that doesn't feel like you know like PBS essentially and doesn't feel government created. I don't know. A lot of people in Washington say the same thing. We have Hollywood, therefore we don't need these other ones. The difference is, though, is that, and you've mentioned this on, on a couple of occasions, number one is the fact that the projection of content out of Hollywood does not necessarily convey state messaging. So it doesn't necessarily talk about the U.S. position on something the way that the Chinese are able to do with their state-owned and their paid media strategies that they have in Africa. And oftentimes, people like Beyonce, for example, as you've pointed out, don't necessarily convey a message that is positive for the United States. A lot talking about Black Lives Matter, police brutality towards African Americans, all these other things. And so that reliance on Hollywood sometimes can be productive but other times can necessarily go against what the, the the political message or the state message from Washington is. So I don't. I think we've gotten comfortable as Americans in thinking that oh, we've got Hollywood, so therefore we don't need to invest in in media. And I think that's that's moronic because today we're finding out that the past ten to fifteen years 
that the Chinese have been building up a propaganda apparatus, uh, both formal and informal in Africa, formal through CGTN, informal through soft power partnerships like with Start Times and Transin and other players like that, uh, is paying real dividends right now when they need it. And they need it because they are able to get into people's homes at a very granular level. So I'm not I'm not 100% sold on that idea of Hollywood as as a, a stopgap for a genuine strategy, a communication strategy on behalf of the state. I think, you know, I think some, you know, one way to kind of push back against that is, um, is by pointing out that it is exactly this kind of chaos of voices that you see that you see coming out of something like Hollywood or the US music industry that that actually ends up having a real organic impact. It's because because the Chinese messaging seems very state centric and very controlled. Um, and it's exactly that kind of like robot voice of the of the massive state kind of effect that the US manages to avoid. You know, and in the process manages to have a, a more kind of organic, more fine grained influence. I think in, in in foreign countries. I, I think it's that that's oh, that's a big debate in public diplomacy studies about you know, kind of which which is better. But I'll tell you, Jack Ma is not a staid uh, character, and he has captured the imagination of young Africans and his ability to own the headlines for weeks on end now for the donations that he's done at a relatively low cost. We're talking about one airplane or two airplanes full of stuff that's then coming through and being distributed across the continent. So on a cost basis, for a country and for a billionaire, it's actually quite small relative to, say, the PEPFAR program that the United States spends billions on every year. Uh, he has really you know, given life in many ways to Chinese soft power that in a way that we haven't seen before. So I think you're right. On one hand, the traditional robotic CGTN anchor who's kind of reading the news in a very boring way in programming that very few people look at. Yeah, that is... Ugh. But Jack Ma and some of the, again, the programming on on Star Times is in a different space now. And I got to say that a lot of people discount this stuff, but I think it's very, very powerful and very, very influential. Final thoughts to you, Cody Kobus. I agree with you. I think it is powerful and influential, but at the same time, they're really up against very set kind of negative ideas about China in Africa, which, which you know, kind of makes me think that it's maybe a more of an uphill battle than it seems. Because, you know, the, these, these donations have, re have immediately beca also become the target of a whole bunch of conspiracy theories. This, you know, one of the, one a big one being this idea that the, the testing kits are, are infected with COVID-19. So it's, it's difficult. The Chinese story is a difficult one to tell in Africa because there are such kind of set ideas against China and because they come from such a low level of awareness in Africa. Whereas frequently, despite all of the horrors of the, the, the West's relationship with Africa, you know, Europe and, and the US frequently get a, a relatively easy ride in Africa. It's a good point. And I think it's interesting, just in the past couple of weeks, we've seen a real change in the levels of distrust about China and the Chinese. Uh, lots of anti-Chinese xenophobia starting to show up on the continent, particularly because people are afraid that Chinese people have coronavirus. And so there's these social media videos that are popping up in Egypt, in Nigeria, in Kenya, and other places where Chinese are being singled out. Uh, and then at the same time, there's these memes that are circulating across the internet about how when the Chinese sent medical teams to Italy, then all of a sudden the numbers of coronavirus cases uh, spiked. Now in Nigeria, people are afraid that a team is coming there. Will that happen again? These are some of the memes that are circulating around. So, you, you know, very good points to, to make. These are the issues that we cover every single day. So if you're interested in what Danny talked about, you're interested in what we've been discussing on Start Times, this is what we talk about uh, in our newsletter that goes out to hundreds of, of senior level stakeholders. So if you are interested in joining the discussion and following what's going on at the granular day-to-day -day level, go over to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe. We'd love to have you part of our reader community. Uh, it's only $149 for a year, and that gives you all access to the site content, our China Africa Experts Network. Uh, students and faculty, only $75 or $7 a month. So that's the price of a latte that you used to go to Starbucks to buy. Now you can't go to Starbucks and buy, so this is a better use of your money to be able to educate yourself about what's going on with the Chinese in Africa. We're also really trying to be this place that is a ocean of calm in a sea of chaos. Um, we are independent. 
nonpartisan. We're not funded by any country, company, or we don't advocate on behalf of any culture. And as, as the world is pulling in different directions to be pro or against everything else, we're trying to really be just an information provider. And so this is really a, the time for high quality information. And what Cobus and I are doing is we're passionate about this and we're going to stay committed to this. So this is going to be an oasis of high quality, impartial information evaluating the China-Africa relationship. So that'll do it for this edition of the China in Africa podcast. If you have any questions about the newsletter, the podcast, anything, you can contact Cobus at cobus at chinaafricaproject.com, uh, C-O, C-O-B-U-S, or you can contact me, Eric, E-R-I-C, at chinaafricaproject.com. We love hearing from you. Lots of students reach out. Lots of folks reach out with paper ideas if they want to publish something on our site, if they want to try out the newsletter for a couple days just to see it before committing to it. All of that. We would love to be able to have that conversation with you. So don't hesitate to reach out and be prepared. You often get really long emails back from me. So you, uh, I really enjoy the, the, the dialogue with folks who listen to the show, especially this late into the program. So that'll do it for this edition. We'll be back Back again next week with another show. For Cobus Van Staden, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. The guys are also on Twitter, where you can find Cobus at Stadinsky or Eric at E. Olander. And be sure to sign up for the weekly China and Africa email newsletter by going to www.chinaafricaproject.com.